In the years preceding the First World War, a grand technological race was at its highest peak yet. New, grand, and gargantuan express-run ocean liners seemed to be popping out every year. In just a decade, the size of these liners had increased by well over 50% and were employing technologies that had almost never been seen before, even on land. Some of those ship classes, such as the Lusitania, Kaiser, Imperator, and Olympic classes, are still well known and beloved today. But after the sinking of the RMS Titanic, and the rude awakening that was the First World War, the transatlantic industry was much different than it was before these events. Many of these liners, express and auxiliary, were either heavily damaged, lost to the sea, or prizes of war. Following the First World War, many of these companies strictly, if they even could, focused on rebuilding their auxiliary fleets, which is especially evident in Cunard. Tastes and attitudes of the traveling public had also begun to shift. It seemed that in the first six years after the war, the Goliath-like floating palaces were a thing of the past. Yes, several notable ones were still around, but there were no new large liners in construction or even in the planning phases. Would they ever return? In 1927, the French line answered that question with a resounding yes with their new flagship, SS Ile de France. Even though she was not the largest or fastest, she turned out to be the starter of a new age for the Express Ocean Liner with her operation, layout, and interior design. Ocean Liners would never be the same again. The beginning of Ile de France's roots can be found in November of 1912, when the French line and the French government made an agreement that simply stated the following. In order for the government to help with construction costs and operation of their ships, the company would need to build four unique express passenger and mail liners. The first of these liners, delayed by nearly five years due to the war, was the SS Paris of 1916. She was a large step forward for the company, employing interiors that began to modernize classic French decor on the Atlantic, as well as being the company's largest ship. The second vessel in this lineup, whether on purpose or by accident, was to be a true game changer. The beginning of construction of the yet unnamed vessel occurred sometime in 1925, probably during the spring or early summer, at the Chantiers de l'Antique Shipyard in saint Nazaire, France. The French line brought Pierre Bateau to the project. For those not as familiar with historical architecture, Pierre was one of the original founders of the Art Deco style, as well as the Streamline Modern style. He would go on to design the interiors of one of the most famous liners in history, the SS Normandy. The future liner would employ this new style of the Jazz Age in 100% of her interiors. This was a huge break for how things were done traditionally on all passenger ships. Much of the time there would be an overall theme around the liner's fittings, but each space, particularly public spaces, would be done in their own unique style while still carrying on the overall theme. Oftentimes, these liners strictly focused on copying styles of older styles of architecture. This new vessel would employ a truly modern and in-the-moment style. Another interesting idea was that of having each, not some, each of her 390 first-class cabins employ different themes within the boundaries of Art Deco. Each one would be slightly different from the next. Finally, they wanted to have the passengers to have as many opportunities as possible to make grand entrances into each of the public spaces as though as they were in royalty in some medieval castle. The launching day of the hull occurred on the 14th of March, 1926, surrounded by thousands, including noble government figures and company executives, the ship was named Ile de France, which is the name of the state in France which includes the city of Paris. In a rather odd move, she was not christened by a bottle of champagne as the company traditionally did. 
After the naming, the hull of Ile de France slid into the river, where it was later towed to the fitting out wharf. That same year, 1926, an elaborate book was published to show off the artistic renderings of the French Line's upcoming flagship. Illustrations of grand open spaces, elegant staircases, unobstructed and clutterless sun decks filled the pages of the book. Fitting out on Ile de France took about 14 months. On May 29, 1927, she left Saint Nazaire to begin her first big test, Sea Trials. On those very successful tests, she was able to reach a comfortable speed of 23.5 knots. She then returned for a brief survey at Brest, and then made her way to Le Havre to prepare for her first voyage. She docked there on June 5th. During that time, she was open to the public. Thousands came aboard. Those who particularly loved the vessel were those in the press, where they praised her for her notable interior design. At a glance, Ile de France's exteriors were fairly traditional, especially when compared to her running mate, SS Paris. Three funnels of equal proportion flanked by two tall masts. A deep black and red hull with a bulky but modest superstructure. One may mistake her for being just that, another traditional ocean liner. All one needed to do was simply enter inside, and it would not take long for them to figure out that she was something special. By mid-June, Ile de France was complete. At 43,153 gross registered tons, she was the largest ship the French Line had ever built, and by far the largest ship built since the end of World War I. Even so, she was only the sixth largest ship ever built, and certainly not the fastest. But that was okay, she was not meant to be either of those things. On June 22, 1927, Ile de France departed La Havre for New York with the luck and love of her countrymen and operators. Upon arrival in New York, it became very clear that her career was going to be a successful one. Many hundreds and thousands waited for her, especially at her attended docking point, Pier 57. The press ran away with her, as they did in France, once again praising her modern decor. Ile de France quickly settled into a routine transatlantic service where she often ran near to capacity. She, like her predecessor, became fashionable. She was especially loved by wealthy and middle-class Americans who wanted to have a chance to be among Europe's social elite, as well as to travel on a flashy, modern vessel. By 1928, thanks to both Paris and especially Ile de France, the French line hit record profits. It was the first time in their history that they received more than a billion francs. Just to get an idea of how much money that is, in today's money, that would be worth $452,727,878,441 francs, or in United States currency, $701,429,122. In July of that year, Ile de France helped pioneer a faster means of mail transport by the installation of a plane catapult at her stern. Two CAMS-37 aircraft would be launched off her within 200 nautical miles of land in order to speed up mail delivery. It often accelerated the expected delivery time by a day. This same system was also famously implemented on SS Bremen of the Norddeutscher Lloyd and SS Leviathan of the United States lines. Even though it did work, it was extremely expensive. By 1930, the catapult was discontinued and the service was terminated. By 1935, things seemed to be going very well for the French line. In June of that year, they got even better. The company's newest flagship, SS Normandy, entered service. She was truly one of a kind, one of the greatest ocean liners ever to be conceived. Not only was she the largest ship ever built, she quickly and easily captured the blue ribbon from the SS Rex and brought national pride to an all-time high. 
the French line could now boast that they had the largest, fastest, and most luxurious fleet on the Atlantic. They now had three ships, Paris, Ile de France, and Normandy on the express run. Only one more was needed to complete that contract. Unfortunately for the French line, this was to be the high point of the entirety of their history. Towards the latter half of the 1930s, things really began to shift towards disaster. Global unrest was increasing as nations began to become extreme and aggressive. Nazi Germany, Fascist Italy, Japan, and the Soviet Union all began to make everyone, at the very least, sweat. For many ocean liner companies, it was a time of great uncertainty. Many of them were based in Europe, and the growing threat was all around them. To make things worse, the Great Depression really began to bite during this time. Passenger cancellations, delays, and voyage scrappings became more frequent. Even with all of this, Ile de France continued to be one of the most popular liners on the Atlantic. By 1935, she had carried more first-class passengers than any transatlantic liner before her. Ile de France may have been doing well, but the French line was really beginning to suffer, albeit at a slow rate. Then came the first nail in the coffin for the company. On April 18, 1939, SS Paris was docked in Le Havre where she was being loaded with many pieces of French art and culture bound for the New York World's Fair. Just behind her was Normandy, whom was in dry dock for regular maintenance. During the day, a fire broke out aboard Paris. Firefighters were immediately called out to put it out. However, possibly foreshadowing the loss of Normandy in just several years, too much water was sprayed onto one side and she began to list alarmingly. By nightfall, she had capsized onto her port side and trapped Normandy in the dock. Paris's masts were eventually cut off in order to free Normandy the next day. In the months leading up to the invasion of Poland, everyone in Europe could tell war was just around the corner. Ile de France ran often at or slightly above full capacity. Many of her passengers were American citizens trying to get away from the looming war. On September 3rd, 1939, Ile de France departed La Havre. Just hours afterward, news reached her that Britain and France had declared war on Germany. As a precaution, lights were dimmed at night. During that crossing, 16 ships were sunk on the Atlantic. Ile de France docked in New York on September 9th, safe and sound. The French line then sent her a message telling her not to return home. Her career as a passenger liner had temporarily suspended. She was soon towed to Staten Island after extensive dredging work had been conducted where her fate would be decided. A skeleton crew of 100 remained on board her for the next five months. In March of 1940, Ile de France was lent to the British Admiralty. She was quickly loaded with war supplies and painted gray. She left New York for Europe soon thereafter. While on a trip in S to Singapore, news reached her that France had fallen to the Nazis. The British then officially commandeered her. In 1941, she returned to New York and made several crossings as a troop ship. In February of 1942, Ile de France's other running mate, Normandy, was undergoing conversion into a troop ship by the United States Navy when a fire broke out on board. In the same way that Paris was lost, Normandy capsized at Pier 88 during the night of February 10th and was a total loss. Now both of her running mates were dead. In August of 1942, Ile de France was docked at Port Elizabeth, South Africa, where her interior was essentially ripped and torn apart as many of her fittings were literally tossed out onto the dock. She was soon converted into a floating prisoner of war camp, decorated with many festoons of barbed wire along her decks. Finally, after several long and disgraceful years as a POW liner, the war finally concluded. At the time, she was in Hoboken, New Jersey receiving upgrades. Those were quickly finished and was then sent off to transport soldiers returning to their homes in Canada, New York, and even Indochina. In late spring of 1947, Ile de France was finally handed back to the French line. Her home, running mates, and owners were vastly different to what she had left behind almost nine years earlier. 
the French line decided to make her an even more modern liner, completely renewing her interiors as well as upgrading her exterior, including the removal of her third funnel, replacing the forward two, changing her paint scheme, and partially adding onto the superstructure. This extensive operation took two years to complete. The upgrades increased her tonnage from 43,153 to 44,356. She was now the fourth largest liner in operation. Her first post-war voyage occurred in August of 1949. When she arrived in New York, she received a festive welcome that included tugs, fireboats, and even a U.S. Navy blimp. She was the French line's second liner to return to service. For two years, the small SS de Grasse had been carrying the load single-handedly. The sight of Ile de France back in New York must have been a tremendous relief. Soon they were both joined by French line's newest flagship, SS Liberté, formerly the SS Europa. On September 21, 1953, Ile de France rescued 25 of a 26 crew of the freighter Greenville following its sinking. It would not be the only time that she would be a rescue vessel. On the 26th of July, 1956, whilst on an eastbound crossing, Ile de France received news that the luxury Italian liner, SS Andrea Doria, had been involved in a collision and was sinking. Upon Ile de France's arrival in the early morning, she rescued 753 survivors in just six hours. Following the operation, she returned to New York and was later given a special plaque commemorating her efforts and received the Gallant Ship Award. Later that year, she ran into a storm that caused six passenger cabins to flood, her superstructure to be dented, 15 portals smashed, and numerous injuries of passengers. A few months later, she ran aground in Martinique, which forced her to be towed to Newport News Shipyard in Virginia for repairs. By 1958, Ile de France was 31 years old, and age was beginning to catch up with her. That same year, the first commercial transatlantic flights occurred. Very quickly, as seen on all liners across the Atlantic, passenger numbers began to decline. Even though the flare was still there, she was no longer convenient and was beginning to be costly in operation. In November 1958, Ile de France departed New York for the last time. Afterwards, the French line quietly removed her from service. Various proposals were put forward on what should become of her, the most ambitious of which was to cut off her funnels and masts, sail her into the heart of Paris, reinstall the funnels and masts, and preserve her there as a museum. In the end, she was sold to Japanese scrappers in Osaka. On the 26th of February, 1959, Ile de France departed her home for the last time, surrounded by tearful well-wishers. At sea, the Japanese flag was raised, and she was renamed Fransu Maru. But before she could arrive in Osaka, Japan, and much of the horror of the French line, she was chartered for $4,000 to be used as a prop for the disaster film, The Last Voyage. The French line sued the filmmakers, MGM, in order to have her funnels repainted and to prevent her original name from ever appearing anywhere in the film. During the filming, she sported the name Claridon. She was partially sunk, explosive devices were set off, and at one point, her forward funnel was sent crashing down into the deck house. Following the filming, she was refloated and towed to Osaka, where scrapping began. By 1961, the Ile de France was no more. Her overall impact on the North Atlantic was considerable, and because of her innovative, bold design, along with the occasional heroic story, her place among the classic ocean liners of the 20th century is secure. I would like to finish this section of the video of Ile de France's life with what I think well summarizes who she really was, as well as her significance and contribution. It can be found in John Maxstone Graham's book called The Only Way to Cross. He states the following. 
The Yield of Franz was perhaps a floating reincarnation of a consistent American fantasy about France and the French. She was an instant success, neither the fastest nor largest, but certainly the smartest. The Yield of France was a great divide, from which point the decorators reached forward rather than back. The absence of traditional frills and the relentless modernity, coupled with the seductive Parisian dream, guaranteed her success.